Good morning. morning. What a way to start the day, because we're going to talk about dying, not living. (laughs) One of the great problems with Christianity is that we have arrived at a point where Jesus does all the dying and we do all the living. And so you, you go into a bookshop and you'll find every instruction on how to live, on all the things that you need to do the latest program, the latest option, the latest possibility. Uh, I'm always fascinated when I get anywhere near a baptismal pool, and I very, very, very rarely hear what I think is the biblical instruction with baptism. It's not come and live, it's come and die. Because as Paul put it, in baptism you die when you go under the water to yourself. And when you come out, you rise to newness of life in Christ. But you can't do the living without the dying. And until we're prepared to die to ourselves, we'll never discover what it means to live for Jesus. So what we're going to do um, this morning is we're going to look at what it means to die first. Uh, Very reluctantly, they're going to start the timer on me, and I'm going to try and keep to it. Because we're going to look in Genesis chapter 22. And if you keep a a thumb in that, uh, we're going to move our way through the story of the sacrifice by Abraham of Isaac. Because there in verse 1 of chapter 22, we read, sometime later, God tempted Abraham. Uh, No, you don't read that. Because God doesn't tempt anyone. You see, if if God gives you a tempt, the difference between a tempter and a tester, and that's the word that actually is used, the difference between the two is a tempter is someone who wants you to fail, and a tester is someone who wants you to pass. I'll never forget when I did first my driving test in, uh, in Britain because I failed. It's different to the driving test here. I promise you. The second time, the driving examiner turned to me, having gone down his clipboard of about 30 items, and said, uh, Mr. Calvert, you are a borderline case. (laughs) But this is a driving test, so I'm going to pass you. However, I will read the local newspaper very carefully for the next few months, (laughs) just to check that I got it right. And the wonderful thing with Abraham and Isaac, is that God tested Abraham. And the thing that we have all missed hold of is the idea that in coming to Jesus, for those of you who were with me yesterday, you will realize that you don't come to Jesus for what you're going to get. You come to Jesus for what you're going to give. You don't come to Jesus for the lovely feelings that he brings into your heart and life. You come to Jesus in order that he might use you to change his world. That the reality and the glorious reality of what God wants to do is he wants a people who will come and die that he may truly live in them. God doesn't want you coming and offering all the great things that you can give to him. God wants you simply coming and allowing him to come and bring all the good things that he wants to give to you. That the whole reality of Christianity, it's not what you bring to God, it's what God brings to you. It's not what you do for God, it's what God does through you. It's not what you can achieve for God, it's what God can achieve in you and through you. And the wonderful reality of it all is that he's not fussy about who he mixes with. And therefore he comes and does all kinds of amazing things through all kinds of unlikely people. I'm just about to leave a church where I've been for 12 years. We have a network of five churches. And I've got a number of people coming to me and saying, why are you going? We know the church has asked you to do another five years. Why not stay? And the answer is, because you've got better things in the wings. I came to train. I've got three younger guys ready to lead. And a 36-year-old, a 38-year-old, and a 40-year-old leading a network of five churches that constitute a megachurch in New England 
is revolutionary, but they're New Englanders. And they're ready to lead. I'm an old Englander. I've had my day. <laughs> and so what I wanted us to look at this morning is what it really means not to come and live, but come and die. And when you do that, what it means, what it brings, what God gives you. Arguably the finest uh, Christian leader of his generation. Not this generation, the one before. is a, a guy uh, named Geni Begu. You may never have heard of Geni Begu, but Geni Begu was the leader of the Albanian evangelical churches when he was 25. The incredible thing about Geni is that he was one of the first crop of converts in Albania. Five were left after World War II, five believers. And then God began to work at the beginning of the 90s. And Geni was in that first crop, so was his wife, Sonny. And what happened in Albania was an incredible story. I remember when half a million Kosovan Muslims crossed the border, fleeing to try to get to safety. And I was desperately trying to get into Albania, and the only way I could do it is by hitchhiking up from Thessaloniki. And I got to Tirana, to the soccer stadium, and there was Guinea Begu uh, trying to organize a few hundred Christians into caring for 3,000 Muslims and demonstrating what the kingdom of God is all about. He has always been an incredible guy. And when revival hit Albania, Geni's hopes and desires were somewhat modest. All he wanted to do was to make Albania the mission-sending center of the Balkans today. And he, he achieved it. Uh, but he got bored. And so by the time the 21st century was upon him, he'd had enough. And so what he did was he quit, and he went to Kosovo, because that was a bit tougher. And when he went to Kosovo, there would probably have been 89 evangelical Christians in Pristina, the capital. And again, he got to work in, in Kosovo. Uh, one of the great Begu stories of what it means to die first is what happened when Geni took a team to the northern outreaches of Kosovo and they'd got a Muslim lady who was very warm to them and agreed to have this team to stay with her overnight. Then at about 11.30 as everyone was sitting up and talking uh, and drinking coffee and sharing, there was this hammering at the door and then it was kicked in and a couple of guys came in with balaclavas, so they were masked, uh, and with AK-47s in their hands, and pointed the guns at the Christians and this Muslim lady, and said, give us everything you've got that is of any value. And so they did. They, they emptied their pockets of everything that they had. And then came the big question, give us the rental car keys. Now, it may not be a big thing to you to think of surrendering the rental car keys. It is a very big thing in Kosovo. Because there, if you lose the rental car, you have to replace it. And so again, he handed over the, the car keys. Everything was taken. And so they were left. And they turned to this Muslim lady and said, well, we probably ought to pray. And so they turned it into a prayer meeting. In the morning, they got up and they walked out of the house. And they looked up the road. And there was the car. What was significant about it was that the doors were hanging open. When they got there, they tried to piece it all together again. Obviously, the two guys had got into the car. Obviously, they had started the engine. Obviously, they had driven off and managed to get about 50 yards. Obviously, at that point, the angel that joined them got a little muscular and difficult. <laughs> Obviously, at that point, these two guys got out of the car and ran for their lives. <laughs> left the vehicle, left the car keys in the ignition, ready for the Christians to reclaim it in the morning. Why am I not surprised about that? Because sometime later, God tested Abraham. And sometime God comes and he tests. 
And uh, Ruth and I are having our 44th wedding anniversary today. And the day has started... <laughs> uh, the day has started badly. We're the fa fairly major test by anybody's standards. But this is going to happen. You see, it's really simple. If your Christian life is quiet, stable, innocuous, moving on, God is blessing you, you are fulfilling everything that is suggested to you on the television screen by the TV evangelist. If your life is like that, you are worse than useless, and I pity you when you arrive in heaven. You see, God does not leave you alone. If you're dangerous, he's going to get you ready. And the devil does not bother with innocuous Christians. He leaves them to their own devices. He only comes and deals with Christians who are a threat to him. And God only allows those kind of things to happen to Christians who are one day going to be a trophy for the kingdom in what they do and what they achieve. As Jim Elliot, who died in 1956 as a martyr at the hands of the Orca Indians once said, he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to save what he'll never lose. And the tragedy is that we get this idea that the blessing of God is evidenced by the peace and comfort we enjoy. It's actually exactly the opposite way around. The blessing of God is evidenced by the pain, the ordeal, the struggle, and the disturbance that we go through. It is in inverse proportion to what the world would expect that God requires of his people. That's why it is so tempting to be told, if you want health, if you want wealth, if you want satisfaction, fulfillment, Jesus will give it. No way. If you want those things, then look in another place. Because if you come to Jesus, you're going to have pain, struggle, difficulty, and problem. And that's normal service. You may say, well, my life's not like that at the moment. Well, that's absolutely fine. Enjoy it. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not a problem. It's what Scripture calls a selah. That means a brief intermission. It's all right, normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. <laughs> it won't last, because if God wants to use you, God will train you and bless you. And he won't do that by giving you comfort. He will do that by testing you. So sometime later, God tested Abraham, because he wanted him to pass, and he wanted him to be ready, and he wanted to make history through Abraham. And that's the glory and that's the joy of what God wants to do. He wants a people who are ready to die for the king and the kingdom. You hear all about the early church? Well, you see, Nero had a nice way of dealing with them. He just took them, uh, he dipped them in pitch, put them in the candle holders around his gardens and set light to them. And that's how the blood of the martyrs really became the seed of the church. Church that can go through that. Church that can move in that way. Church that I have seen all around the world. Churches like that change the world. Churches that aren't like that become like the world instead. Are you still there? <laughs> Don't worry, it's going to get worse. So as we move on, we discover that Abraham is, is challenged. God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And it's, it's a great challenge. Take your son, the object of your hope, your only son, the object of your faith. Isaac, whom you love, the object of your love. Take your faith, hope, and love and sacrifice them. Get them ready for me. And what Abraham does is he stays in bed and he hopes against hope that God will change his mind. And he gives God till midday. No, he doesn't. 
Scripture is emphatic in verse 3 of Genesis 22, early the next morning. He gets up quick, gets on with it, before God changes his mind. And he moves out on a limb, ready to risk everything. And that is so important. My favorite church in the world is Iran. I know you may find that strange, but you see, I, I've been uh, and worked in probably a hundred different countries, and I think Iran is the best. I've never met Christians like the Iranians, and I've never seen faith like Iranian faith in action. One of my favorite stories comes from my friend Bishop Edward, and um, he tells the story of, of how he practiced discipleship, how he taught them to die young. And remembering that there is the Evan prison in Tehran, remembering what it can mean to be a Christian, especially if you try to bring Muslims to Christ. They got a great training program. And this is a few years ago, but what Bishop Edward did was he'd got these two young believers and he wanted to get them going on the pathway, so this is how he did it. He said, what I want you to do is uh, on Monday, I want you to go to the church bus and I want you to fill it with Bibles. Then I want you to drive to this village to the north of Tehran and all I want you to do is sell the Bibles and then come back. So they did. But they had wisdom. Although young believers, they got up early. They got up at five in the morning. Now, I have met the Iranian secret police in the early hours of the morning. And it is not an experience that one necessarily wants to repeat too often. They decided that at five in the morning, uh, nobody would be around. And there wouldn't be any secret police. So they would get their way out of Tehran. And they were driving the bus, having filled it with Bibles, out of Tehran when they suddenly realized that they'd not bothered to get instructions as to how to get to the village they'd got to go to. So they realized they didn't know where they were going. Pretty confident to get out of Tehran, but then they weren't sure what happened. So they thought, well, really easy, we'll stop and ask someone where to go. And the problem was there was no one on the streets. But that was when the steering wheel jammed. And it jammed into a right turn position. So they were forced to take the first right turn. And as they went around the turn, there was a guy standing on the street corner. So they thought, well, glory, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We'll stop the vehicle. Uh, we'll ask this guy the road to this village. Uh, and then we'll make our way having unjammed the steering wheel. Well, they got out of the vehicle and went up to the guy and said, do you know the way to the village of so-and-so? He said, you got Bible. They said, no, 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 no. We want the village of so-and-so. He said, you got Bible. They said, no, 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 no. You could be secret police. He said, yes, I could, but you got Bible. He said, I pray God for Bible, for village. God say, you go to Tehran, wait on this corner. At six in the morning, I send Bible. <laughs> now, I know you may not believe it, but you see, I have seen this lot do this stuff so often. I suspended my powers of disbelief about the Iranians years ago. <laughs> you got Bible? Well, yes. Good, I got life savings. Brought out 60 bucks. They said, well, we got 100 bucks for the Bibles, but we'll, we'll give you the lot. And they gave him the box full of Bibles. He stuck them on his shoulder. Um, told them where the village was and walked off into the morning. And they got back into the bus and realized, well, we don't need to go to the village. I haven't got any Bibles left. So they went back to the church. You may say, well, how did, you do, how did they do that? Well, it was quite easy because the steering wheel wasn't jammed anymore. And it's never, ever jammed since. And you see, it, it really is so simple for these guys. 
Uh, they just worked it out a long time ago. And do you know what the fastest growing church is in the world? It's Iran. 19% last year. Don't believe me? Check Operation World. Uh, do you know what their missions outreach is? Because Iran speaks Farsi, and so they have a missions outreach. Do you know where it's to? Afghanistan. Do you know what the second fastest growing church is in the world? <laughs> Afghanistan. And it is just glorious to see what it means that these folks, they, their passion is Jesus. Their love is Jesus. Their delight is Jesus. And the reality is that whether you're working with Iranian churches in Germany or the States, whether you're working with them in Britain or Turkey, uh, whether you're working with them in Iran, I, I've worked with the Iranians now for 30 years. I did the memorial service for the last martyred bishop. I've never seen faith quite like it. Just the reality. Uh, you go to a baptismal service and probably most of the baptismal candidates are women. And they've all got one thing in common. They're all divorced. And the reason they're divorced is the husband said, me and your children or your Jesus. And they chose their Jesus, which is why they're getting baptized. You see, the whole concept of a comfortable, convenient, passive Christianity is not something that works. It didn't work in Abraham's day. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and nothing's changed, folks. It's not supposed to be a game. It's supposed to be reality. It's supposed to be the real thing. God is looking for a people who are really prepared to go out on a limb. And so, Abraham and uh, Isaac make their way uh, with the servants, and when they finally get where they're going, uh, Abraham says, well, stay here to the servants, stay here. Uh, the boy and I will go. And they take wood. And Abraham is so confident the Lord will provide. He knows that somehow his God will get this through. In fact, if you read in Hebrews, you discover that what he actually thought would happen was that he would sacrifice Isaac and then God would raise him from the dead. That's not what's going to happen. There's going to be a voice from heaven that says, Stop! But the reality is that there has to be a faith that is something different to the way that we've looked at it and to what we've believed for it. That when Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the power of his death and resurrection. It is incredible to recognize that what God wants is a life where it's not just Jesus who does the dying, but we do as well. And that we're ready to lay our lives down, whatever that means, in order that he may live through us. And the reality of what he does is so incredible and the power of what he produces. I, I loved what Jim said the, the first night. I loved listening to him and uh, I loved hearing um, the way that, that he spoke, but he actually referred to Rodney Stark um, as later Dennis was going to as well. And Stark is a sociologist. But what Stark wrote in his first book was he pointed out that there were two great events in the Roman world that changed history. Both of them were plagues. One was in the 3rd century, one was in the 6th century. And those two plagues changed the whole of the story of the church. 
the first plague in the third century. Cyprian was Bishop of Carthage in North Africa. And when the plague struck, he took the best in the church, the young men and the young women. Now, we're going to have a little bit of elderly bias coming out here. Because I was ordained when I was 22. And I went on the road with a team of a dozen young men and women. One of them, the musician Graham Kendrick, who wrote Shine, Jesus, Shine, and a number of other things. But we went on the road with one dream. We wanted to see Britain come back to Jesus. And we believed that sitting at home wasn't going to do it. So we went on the road to challenge the church to be church in our generation. It's a long story of what happened. It's a long story to the days that today 300,000 people in school hear the gospel every single month, courtesy of the British government. And Christians who come out of that background of we're going to get this world back for Jesus. And it's so important to recognize that my Jesus took disciples who weren't old men with gray beards. They were in their teens and early 20s and he took them to change the world. It's incredible when you look at the way that time and again, uh, it's all right guys if you're, uh, and ladies if you're older and feeling comfortable at this moment, just remember that Moses was 80 when he started. <laughs> so you're not going to escape. But I want to come to those who are younger, as Jeremiah was only a youth, and say so often God takes the young ones and gets them ready for all that the future is going to bring. And that's what Cyprian did. He took the young men and the young women and he sent them into the plague areas. And he sent them to feed the sick, care for the dying, minister hope, and care for those who no one else would ever come anywhere near. So uh, they got a name for them in Carthage. They called them the Parabolani. This has been doctored in a number of church history books so that it doesn't appear. Because this kind of church history is so unacceptable to us today. But the reality of the Parabolani is that they really did give their lives for Jesus. They died by the score. But they got fed up with people dying of the plague. So they took their mouths, they put them over the suppurating sores of the plague victims, and they sucked out the poison in the name of Jesus. And even more died. But Carthage was never the same again. Because when the world saw what it really means to live and to die for Jesus, the world got the message. It is so incredibly important that the spirit of the Parabolani is reborn again today. I'm tired of hearing the politicians' rhetoric. I'm tired of hearing the yells and the extremism. I want to see some healthy extremism coming out of the church. I want to see a church rising up again that's ready to die and to live for Jesus. I'm wanting to see something that is the rebirth of what we were intended to be like. I'm wanting to see the spirit that goes up the hill and carries the sticks, recognizing that somehow uh, Father knows what's going to happen and this is all going to work out in the end. That it is so important that we realize that we need to be ready and we need to get a move on. And we need to be there prepared to sacrifice. And then there needs to be a degree of commitment that is going to go all the way and bring about transformation and change. It has to be. The Parabolani have to live again. There has to be a new generation. Now I can take you to countries of the world where you'll see it. I can take you to an Albania that is reaching the Balkans. I can take you to a Cambodia 
that is being transformed with the love of Jesus in such a way that they're even having to close the roads so that the presentation of health care and the gospel can go on. I can take you to countries like southern Sudan, where with all the pain and all the distress, church is rising up to be church in the name of Jesus. And it is incredible to recognize that God is looking for a people who are going to be different. In Mozambique, in the middle of the flood, when the Limpopo overflowed its banks, and when rats, snakes, and people inhabited the same trees, one friend of mine quietly went out on a limb to change his world. He was a surgeon. He'd gone from South Africa, his home, to Mozambique to be a surgeon with a colleague, and it all got too much. They were totally incapable of meeting the challenges. And so he gave up his surgery, did my friend Peter. And what Dr. Peter did was he just took a bunch of Mozambican women and taught them how to go and teach breastfeeding in the local communities. And these women started going from village to village, teaching breastfeeding and basic health care. Today, they and those they train each year reach 300,000 women. And the result of that is they don't just take health care, they take Jesus. And I took a friend of mine who's head of the National Association of Evangelicals here in the US, because he didn't believe me. And I took him into the Mozambican bush. And we had a lunch, sitting at primitive tables in the bush. And I said, you don't believe me, do you? So I've got five ladies here who want to talk to you. Do you mind if they talk to you over lunch? He said, no. One by one they got up and they simply said, we heard about breastfeeding. We heard about saving the lives of our kids. We heard about reaching our community. We went out to the next village and the next village to do the same. We met this Jesus in whose name this was being done and surrendered our lives to him. By the way, each one of us was a witch doctor in our village. You see, this whole business that we love to talk about, the way that we can stand up and announce and proclaim and buy a TV channel and broadcast and it's going to change the world. What changes the world is when the people of God are ready to be the Parabolani and live and die for Jesus. What changes the world is when you're ready to go out on a limb and whatever he calls you to do and whatever it's going to mean, you are ready to be the people of God in a world that desperately needs the people of God to be the people of God. You see, what we've got wrong in all of this as Abraham trudges his way up that mountain and wonders what's going to happen. You've seen the Sunday school pictures they are a load of rhubarb. <laughs> because you've got the picture of this old man, which is true. Do the math. He was a hundred when he got his son. He's now a hundred and thirty. That doesn't make Isaac twelve. That makes Isaac 30. And that young man could have got off the altar his father put him on and put his old dad there instead <laughs> and they could have had a different kind of sacrifice that in our economic understanding might have been a wiser way to do it. But there wasn't one person committed to the will of God, there were two. And we need to be ready for that. I have worked with three young guys for the last 12 years to get them ready. Right now, I'm not going to be a cork in the bottle. I'm going to get out of the way. But they have been prepared to work with me for 12 years while I was the cork in the bottle. 
stopping them going any further. It is really important that we get it, that there has to be a degree of commitment and a degree of commitment where we allow our God to make a difference. Do you want to see what it's like when you actually get that sort of life for Jesus? Now, I'm going to take you to Iran, but I want to ask for your help, all right? I've got full permission to use this. And I don't tell stories about countries in the world without checking them really, really carefully. And I have full permission to use this film. Firstly, I apologize for it. It's not how I would have made it. But it's how the people who have made it have done it because this is what they know. The message makes it more than worth watching. However, if you get hold of this in any form, do not release it in any way for a TV channel or anything similar. You kill people by doing those kind of things. It's perfectly open for you to see. We'd like you to see it and pray for Armand. We'd just like you to remember that you can talk about what God is doing, but be wise about how you do it. And for those of us for whom these are some of the most amazing things that we're seeing in our world today, let's rejoice together that our God is not dead. He's alive and is coming to ordinary people. Would you look at the screens as I take you to Iran today? Did you enjoy that? It's an amazing story. It's incredible when you think about it. God is testing people to be ready to serve him. God is calling us to get up and get a move on and get going. God wants us to be committed in such a way that we can really see him work. And we never realize what it's going to mean. I was in Iran um, 13 or 14 years ago and uh, those were the days when the churches were still open. And I was asked if I would be prepared to talk to leaders. And so they brought together about 60 leaders from within 50 miles of Tehran and locked every window and barred every door because this would be the first time a Westerner had preached since the Ayatollah came to power. And I was in one of those positions when you think, what do you say? I haven't a clue what to say. So I shared what was on my heart. A few years later, there was an earthquake in a place called Bam in southern Iran. And uh, I was out at the earthquake, uh, working with the Iranian churches and trying to get them Uh, involved and engaged and to channel uh, resources and support to them. While I was there, a guy named Vatan Avanissian, who's a friend of mine, uh, and a Kurd, and the head of the Iranian churches at the time, Vatan said to me uh, one day, do you remember preaching in Tehran? I said, yes. He said, do you remember what you preached on? I said, I think so. (laughs) He said, do you remember what your points were? (laughs) I tried, and he said, "Uh, yeah, but the fourth one was... And this is so ridiculous, because these guys are heroes. But there is something about the link, you see. The way that we have written off what is happening, we have forgotten what it means to be family and have the commitment of family. It's not a matter of which countries we go to and change. It's a matter of which countries we are prepared to go to and work with the Lord Jesus in. 75% of the resources for the Lord's church in the world is entrusted to the church in North America. And about 20% of the need. He's done that because he trusts us. And he trusts us to work 
dead to ourselves, not trying to get a nice feel-good factor because we've got a pretty picture on our, our refrigerator, not trying desperately to um, claim that this is our ministry and what we do, but recognizing that we're dying to ourselves. While I was in Bam, I met Pastor Fatih, a bright young Iranian pastor. I never knew our paths would cross again. The link really comes to December the 14th, 2012, when I was driving up to the church after doing a breakfast meeting, and there I, I had at that time about 20 young pastors in training, uh, and there was one of the pastors outside the church weeping. And I stopped the car and said, what is it? He said, I think Alistair's dead. Alistair was his eight-year-old. He said, but my wife's coming. I said, well, you're not driving, so get in with me. Uh, I said, what happened? He said, I, I, we've heard there's a shooting uh, at the school and someone may have died. When we got there, um, I found that I was the first clergyman there uh, surrounded by people. The police were just about getting to the point of saying, if you've got your children, will you go that way? If you haven't, uh, will you go into the firehouse? And of course, what happened was ultimately we found that 26-year-old children had been massacred. Uh, the school was in Sandy Hook. I live in Newtown. And we discovered that what happened next was as we passed through the day and Ruth and various other of the pastors tried to give help and comfort. That evening we had 700 people together to pray. But things were very, very difficult. We lost 24% of our home congregation of the five churches that we have. Uh, that year we lost nearly a million dollars in giving. Uh, we lost 300 volunteers who were the heart of the church. Um, it wasn't so much that people were leaving Jesus. Uh, it's just that we could have planted new churches with what we sent to South Carolina, Arizona, North Carolina, Texas, California. It wasn't the taxes or the climate it, when the security went as well. The secure traditional Christians went. What that meant when you've got 24% of your congregation missing as well uh, and that these are the folks who make the church happen, is you've got to start bringing people in, and that happened. But remember that for these folks, Jesus wasn't world-changing. He didn't bring their children back, and he didn't stop it happening. And so we found that 14% of our congregation came to church every week. 38% came once a month. Jesus was still worshipped, but much more from a distance. Now, when you're in New England, and already it's only 4%, well, 3.4% of the congregation who go to church uh, at an evangelical church, you're, it's really difficult. One of our satellites, 1% of the population are evangelical Christians. So we have a church of 62 people. It's a mega church <laughs> in, in that particular satellite. And so it's hard enough. So with all of that, my people needed something. That's when they got a message from Pastor Fatih in Iran, in the Evan prison, who's been there for the best part of five years and has heard what's happened at Sandy Hook and wanted to write to his friends to encourage 
support, inspire us to keep going and not to give up. By the grace of God, and now, uh, over three years later, uh, things are largely back. I mean, we've got a much younger church. Uh, we've got an awful lot of newer converts than you would normally have. A lot of the maturity is not there. But it's amazing that an Iranian writes to say, we're all committed together. You see, he was in jail, but he died already. Died to himself, died to his own purpose, died to his own desires, died to what he wanted. It was just living for Jesus. And so you get this glorious moment when Abraham's uh, dagger is stopped when it was poised to plunge into his son's heart. And as they go down the mountain together, God speaks and God says something that's really quite odd. Because God says, because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Well, that's an odd thing to say. Because if you look in the ancient Near East on a normal night, you can see 600 stars in the sky. If it's a really brilliant night, you can see 2,000. You ever started counting sand on the seashore? And stopped at 2 billion? <laughs> no, I realize that this, you know, Abraham may well have been saying, now what do you mean, Lord? Do you mean I'm going to have... Um, 600 descendants or 6 billion? I realize it's only the odd zero to you, but... <laughs> Which do you mean? And, of course, the incredible thing is that what God has done is he's just given and given and given after the obedience of one man. And Abraham and his servants go back to Beersheba and they settle down again. And I don't know if you've ever bothered to read verses 20 to 24, but they're worth reading. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcar is also a mother. She's born sons to your brother Nahor, Uz the firstborn and Buzz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf and Bethrel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Rumah, also had sons, Tibar, Gaham, Tahash, and Marka. Isn't that wonderful? Oh dear. <laughs> A sad case of biblical illiteracy. You see, the message, the family message comes round. Abraham, you're an uncle. Your brother Nahor has had kids. Uz, the firstborn, and his brother Buzz. Oh, it's wonderful stuff. And then you go down the list. And, and we miss it. But you see, something's happening. Because one of them, Bethuel, has become the father of a little girl named Rebecca. And Rebecca is going to marry the boy who was sacrificed and they're going to have sons. One of them is going to be named Yaakov, Jacob, and renamed Israel. Israel. And it's all going to happen. All because somebody knew how to die to himself. When you look at what Jim Elliot's death in Ecuador achieved, when you see what has happened out of the death of the Parabolani, when you look at the martyrs of the church, when you recognize what God has done, then you realize that it's about a destiny. A destiny that comes from a commitment. A commitment that comes from a sacrifice, a sacrifice that comes from a testing. And God tests you that you may sacrifice and you may commit 
and you may achieve your destiny. Of course there's another way to live. You can just have an ordinary life and enjoy it. Of course you can do what everybody today is desirous of doing. Would you just settling down and not letting this all go too far? Of course we can have it ordinarily, but what Jesus wants is for you to come and die. Uh, he's made room on his cross for you to share it with him. That you can be crucified with Christ and die to yourself. And when my Jesus preached the gospel, he didn't preach it in terms of, I have come to give you everything you need. He preached it in terms of, come and die. Let a man deny himself. Take up his cross. Follow after me. If he wants to be my disciple. A friend of mine used to put it like this. Lord, I want to die to me but I really don't like crucifixion. So would you put a Roman guard at the foot of the cross or I'm going to scream blue murder and want to come down again and keep me there that I may die to me and live to you. Somebody said to me the other day, do you mean that we're not going to enjoy life or anything else? No, I think life has been incredible. I don't know how Riz found it, but I've loved it. Whatever... God calls of you is, is absolutely fine. We, we had a call one day um, to leave Britain and to come to America. That may not sound like suffering for the kingdom to you. <laughs> but it can do if you've got two boys. And if your girls come with you, but your boys stay in Britain, 117 and 119, and you know, you know, that they will both leave church and leave Jesus. And they didn't let me down. They did exactly what I knew they would do. My 17-year-old said, how can a God of love break up a family like us? My 19-year-old said, if that's the kind of God we love and serve, he can get stuffed. On his, seven, on his 18th birthday, my 17-year-old drank a pint of beer for every year of his life. One of his friends stayed up with him because, of course, he collapsed on the 18th pint. Did pretty well to get that far, but... <laughs> he did collapse on the 18th pint. When he woke up in the morning, he thought, well, my dad always told me that I should love him and love Jesus and live for Jesus and serve Jesus, and Mum always said the same. Maybe they were right walked into a London forest preserve, sat on a park bench and gave his life to Jesus. His older brother was much more stubborn. Didn't really get there until southern Sudan. But he finally worked it out. And uh, the incredible thing is that God knows what God's doing. It broke our hearts to leave our kids. But the reality is that both the boys would say, we were living off your faith, not ours. We probably wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for you going. The reality is that my older son is the communications head of a mission because he works with non-verbal communication. And my younger son is um, number two, the head of missions for the Evangelical Alliance. That's the Evangelical Churches of the United Kingdom. It's just incredible how God does it. It's just incredible that the word is not go and live, but come and die. It's amazing that God wants us ready to give what we can't afford, to go where we'd never want to be, to actually surrender all that we are in a way that means we come and die just as he died for us. I have got three minutes left. And it is a really risky thing to tell a story that your friends have heard before. But I'm going to do that and hope that Holly will forgive me. Because <laughs> it just sums it up. I'm British. <laughs> well, we're American citizens and that's marvellous, but my roots go back in an old country. And the British love their concert halls. Love them. And an impresario hired a concert hall for one night and gave it to a young student pianist 
who played Bach and played out of his skin. And the impresario had packed the concert hall with people. And when he'd finished, the British forgot they were British. They stood. What an overdose of undue enthusiasm. <laughs> they cheered, they yelled, some even stomped their feet. Most unseemly. <laughs> the impresario went running round the back to the green room to tell the young student how fantastic it was. Now he needed to play an encore. The student said no. The impresario said, why not? They're standing for you. The young man said, no, they're not. That old man in the balcony, three rows from the rear, he's sitting. Oh, he doesn't know his music, said the young man. That said the impresario. Oh, yes, he does know his music, said the young man. That old man sitting there is my teacher. If he was standing, I'd play an encore. Everyone else is standing. He's not. No encore. 2,000 years ago, a man named Stephen died. When he died, the Jesus who is seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven saw Stephen die. And Scripture says Jesus wasn't seated. Scripture says Jesus was standing. Standing to welcome his servant home. Standing to welcome home, not one who lived for him, but one who died for him. And the incredible thing is that I do not want to be part of a church that has Jesus sitting. I want to be part of a church that gets Jesus standing. I want to see a different standard of Christian life among a new generation of young people who will go further than mine ever did. I want to see a new demonstration of love and commitment in the church of Jesus Christ that means we die to us and live only to him. I want to see something happen that makes all the difference. You may say, but you're retiring. Yes. Lying in a hospital bed realizing that I couldn't go on in the way that I had. And so I'll retire, but Ruth and I well, well, Mozambique, Iran, Turkey, New England, one or two other little places if they'll let us in. Because we've got to get Jesus standing. When we get home, he's got to be standing for us, not sitting for us. We've got to live in a way that shows that we're not living for us, we're living for him because we died to us and we live to the one who gave his life entirely for us. Church, it is time we lived in a way that gets Jesus standing because we're dead. <laughs>